What is our nature? What does it mean to be human? One of my earliest memories I have when I was young, before my fifth birthday party, was going door to door with a bunch of other kids. We had a list of stuff, and I have a vague memory that it was a kind of competition. It was a competitive scavenger hunt. And we would take turns knocking on the door and asking for stuff on the list. Hi, could we, um, do you have a coat hanger we could have? Wahoo, thank you, treasure. A modern adult version of scavenger hunting is geocaching. It's a kind of a spontaneous emergent hobby of treasure hiders and treasure hunters. If you're a treasure hunter and you're going someplace in the world, like Malta, for example, you can look up the website for the Maltese geocachers and find clues to hidden treasure. And you follow the clues, you find the treasure, you open this hidden box, there's cool stuff inside. The kind of rule is that you add your own stuff, you sign the guest book, and you leave it for the next person. A long, 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 long time ago, way back in the B.C., when the Phoenicians were first starting to sail around the Mediterranean Sea and explore their area, long before they were a naval superpower, they were sailing along, along the coast of Africa, and they saw these Africans. And they did what every other human almost always does when they encounter another group of humans that they've never seen before. They figure out how to trade with one another. And the way they do this is almost always the same. The Phoenicians rowed a boat ashore. They left a bunch of stuff on the beach, and they went back to their boat, and they waited. The Africans came and inspected the stuff. And the general accepted rule is, even though they have never met each other before, this always happens the same way, is if the Africans like the stuff, they take the stuff. If they don't like the stuff, they leave the stuff. If they leave the stuff, the Phoenicians add more stuff until the Africans take the stuff. Then they leave their own stuff. Then the Phoenicians check out the stuff. If they like the stuff, they'll take the stuff. If they don't like the stuff, they'll leave the stuff. If they leave the stuff, the Africans will add more stuff. And then they take the stuff and, all right, thanks a lot, see you next time. And they sail off. They believe this is exactly what happened when the Vikings first interacted with the North Americans, the Native Americans, around 1000 AD. They did this kind of secret, somehow instinctive trade with other humans. In the book Man, Economy, and State by Murray Rothbard, economist, he explains how every time we think of doing something, we think in terms of trade, even if we're by ourselves, We're sitting at home, watching TV, we decide we want something to eat. Our present state is not having any food. We have this potential imaginary state in the future that involves us having food. So the goal is, how do we trade what I have for what I want? And in order to do that, in order to change our present state for a better future state, it's going to cost something. We have to spend energy. We have to spend raw materials. We have to undergo a little bit of risk. We have to incur opportunity costs, the things we'll miss out on. While we're in the kitchen making something to eat or waiting for the microwave to finish cooking our burrito, we might miss the best commercial ever made that everyone at work is going to be talking about, and it's going to be banned, and we'll never get a chance to see it. <clears throat> Another economist, David Salerno, explains in one of his books how he impresses the importance of trade on his students in basic economics class. The first day of class, he gives everybody a T-shirt but he makes sure that the t-shirts don't fit anybody. If you're a big person, you have a small t-shirt. If you're a small person, you have a big t-shirt. And they don't know what's happening. This is the first day of school. They have no idea what's going on. And so he says, before we start, let's measure the average happiness on a scale of 1 to 10. Anybody 1? Anybody 2? Anybody 3? And they go all the way up to 10. And usually, they get an average score of 5 or 6. 
which is understandable. It's the first day of class. You might be a little hungover. You're maybe hoping just to get a syllabus and go home, and now you got this t-shirt that doesn't fit. What the heck is going on? This sucks. I'm a five. But then he says, okay, get up and trade. Trade what you have for what you want. And at first, everyone's kind of like, what? This is, come on, man, really? But it kind of gets more and more excited, more and more lively, more and more animated, and people start trading. And pretty soon they start acting like they're on the floor of the stock exchange. Anybody, I got a small, small here, yeah, large over there, come on, come on, let's trade. They're all screaming and yelling at each other. And eventually it all settles down, and they all sit back down, and he says, okay, let's check again. What's your level of happiness? Anybody one, anybody two, anybody three? And they go all the way up. And invariably, the average level of happiness goes from five or six up to eight or nine. And he asks the class, how is this possible? We are all in the same physiological state. Nobody ate anything. Nobody drank anything. Nobody left to relieve themselves. We all have the same stuff in this room that we had before. How is everybody happier? And he explains that's what trade does. When you have two people and they both want what the other person has more than what they have, when they trade, both people are better off. And he says, not only did you trade t-shirts, but you traded stories. You traded names. Some of you traded phone numbers. Trading with another human, even if they're a complete stranger, is a naturally good feeling because that's who we are. We like to share what we have so we can get something better in return. Another economist, Jeffrey Tucker, wrote an article in an economic magazine about how he carefully watched his kids after Halloween. They came home from trick-or-treating. They dumped out all their candy on the dining room table. They sat around. They started trading. But what he noticed for the first time is they started to spontaneously use Tootsie Rolls for money. Nobody told them how to do this. They just kind of figured it out on their own. They would sell a piece of candy for two Tootsie Rolls. They would buy a piece of candy for three Tootsie Rolls. And they were just like at any marketplace you could find in any civilization at any point in human history, buying and selling for whatever currency the system was using. <clears throat> There's a law of economics called Say's Law by a guy named Say who lived around the 1800s. And Say's Law basically says that supply creates its own demand which is kind of intuitive if you think about it. When you go to work, you're building stuff to hopefully be sold, and you're participating in the supply side of the economy. But then you get off work, you get your paycheck, you go to Taco Bell to buy your dinner, you're part of the demand side of the economy. Every time you add more people to an economy, you add both supply and demand. You can't increase supply without also increasing demand. You can't increase demand without also increasing supply. They both go together. Now imagine a metaphorical city of a thousand people, the only city on earth. You can't really make a lot of stuff with only a thousand people. Maybe food, shelter, clothing, basic necessities. But suppose you have 10,000 people. That's a lot more stuff that you can make. Now imagine you have 100,000 people. With that many people, that's when you start to get culture that just kind of emerges from this civilization. And what is culture? Art, religion, philosophy, science, the kind of food and shelter and clothing people use. Where does all this come from? Where does culture arise from? If you went back in time a million years and watch the bird build a nest, it would build the same nest that it builds today. If you went back in time a million years and watched a bunch of bees build a beehive, they would build the same beehive they build today. This is what biologists call an extended phenotype. Our genotype is our genes, our DNA. The phenotype is the stuff the genes make, our eye color, our hair color, how tall we are, how gorgeous we are. But some animals have an extended phenotype. Their genes drive them to make stuff outside of their body. Humans also have an extended phenotype. But unlike birds, 
and bees and beavers and ants, we don't make the same stuff over and over and over again. We look out into the world and we see what exists and we make something better from our imagination. And we make that from the realm of imagination to the realm of reality so that we can trade it for something better. We apply our skills to the world so we can get treasure in return. Some geocachers like to play dangerously. You'll be following some treasure map, some list of treasure clues, and you'll get to a point, all right, the treasure is 20 feet that way, but right here is the border to North Korea. What do we do? Should we turn around and go home, or should we go after the treasure and hopefully we don't get caught? Because treasure hunting is fun. The greater the risks, the greater the reward. The only other time I remember going door to door as a kid was selling ice cream social tickets for my second grade baseball team. We sell a ticket, they give us money, they take the ticket, they go down to the elementary school on a Saturday afternoon during summer like today, the adults eat ice cream, the kids play games, because that's what humans do. We get together, we form groups, we form societies, we form civilizations, we share stories so we can get something better. Kids play games by applying their skills to the game so they can get treasure in return, because that's what we do, that's who we are. That is our nature, to share what we have so we can get something better. Thank you.